Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the August 20th, 2012 Washougal City Council meeting and ask that you please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Could you call the roll, please? Councilmember Boger? Present. Councilmember Plinsky? Here. Councilmember Greenlee? Here. Councilmember Lindsay? Here. Councilmember McDaniel? Here. Councilmember Shoemaker? Here. Councilmember Freeman? Here. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the agenda this evening? Okay, hearing none, do we have any correspondence? No. And that brings us to the first opportunity for anyone from the public that would like to address council this evening. Mr. Olson, good evening. Thank you. If you'd hand those out, Mr. Moger, I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> Mayor, guard, counselors, and citizens of Washougal. Mayor, guard, when you Harvey, and city Har administrators... Harvey, pardon? could get your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Harvey Olson, 3903 R Street. That's letter R in this wonderful town of Washougal. Mayor Guard, when you and City Administrator Scott proposed a plan to privatize the Water Department, you opened the door for the Council to consider the privatization of all City Departments or the potential elimination of any City employee other than in the police and fire departments. Is this really the goal of the council? Have you considered that the action of privatization of the water department means that the city will lose all control of the quality of the employees hired and the supervision of the day-to-day -day activities of these contracted employees? Do you really want the quality of the water supply of Washougal to be maintained by employees over whom the city has very little or no control? Water is the most basic requirement for human survival, and even the possibility that our water supply could be compromised is unacceptable. Perhaps it would be more financially prudent to privatize some of the office staff positions finance, for example, which would undoubtedly create even greater financial gains and have less of a potentially negative impact on day-to-day -day services provided to our citizens. In my experience, the contracting out of public services to private vendors is seldom satisfactory due to lack of control of the day-to-day -day operation of the services provided to the people of that community. I believe that privatization could possibly achieve short-term financial gains only to ultimately create long-term losses. Historically, when the contracts are, are renegotiated after the date of expiration, the cost increased dramatically, eliminating any future savings. Thank you for your time. Anybody have any questions on what I've commented on? Thank you, Harvey. Yes, sir. Are there any other members of the public that would wish to address council? Good evening. It's Mike Norris, uh, 2241 G Street in Washougal. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity. I, I know it's been done in the past, but uh, I'd like to say thank you to uh, former council members, uh, Molly Coaston, and Rod Morris and and current member Paul Greenlee and anyone any other city officials that uh, uh, were instrumental in uh, making the improvements on E Street. I, you know, it's I ride my bike on it. I see a lot of other pedestrians using it. I think it's it's a whole lot safer. I think it's a, it's a really boon to this community, really a benefit. And uh, but by the you know while we're on the subject. Uh, I've got a bone to pick with that project. Uh, I live on the north side of G Street uh, at 23rd, basically, and that's just a good size 
part of the town there on the north side that it, ever since we've moved here 26 years ago up until that project there was a crosswalk at 20th that crossed across East Street. Mark crosswalk, nice big white stripes. When that project was finished it wasn't there anymore. And uh, I think it's an accident waiting to happen. I think it's a dangerous situation that, that should be corrected. I think it not only should have a crosswalk there, it should have these signs like we have over here on uh, River Road and around the fire station. Nice big bright green crosswalk sign. I think it's a matter of public safety. And then I would like to see sidewalks continued further south to hook up with the sidewalks on the south side of the railroad tracks. I don't know if there's been a lot of discussion about that or not or if that's on the, on the list of things to be done. But actually, I'd like to see each and every one of you park on the north side of E Street and uh, just take a walk across E Street. Take a walk down south towards the railroad tracks and see how vulnerable you feel. There's no site. It's a really narrow street. They put those pylons in there when we got the silencing project with the railroad done. And it's you're really vulnerable feeling walking down there. So I'd really like to see an improvement over there, especially put the crosswalk in. There's a lot of kids. There's new kids in the neighborhood. There's elderly people. You know, they want to use the, the library or come downtown for an ice cream cone. They deserve to be protected there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I was smiling because we actually have just had meetings in the last couple of weeks on both of those issues. So. Yeah, there are some things that are coming forward. Um, I, you may be as surprised as I was to find out that we can no longer put crosswalks onto roadways without having a traffic control device there. So we're trying to find some uh, uh, answers that are traffic control devices without putting a stoplight there and still be able to qualify in there. But your points are well taken. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would wish to address council? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ed Failer. I live at 40119 Southeast 33rd Street. I'm not a resident of uh, the town of Washable, but I was raised, born, and grown up here. And uh, this privatization thing, I spent 32 years in government service, and I've seen a lot of it. And it doesn't work. Works in the beginning, but it doesn't work in the end. And what you people are proposing, I think the biggest thing you're going to lose out of all this is morale. And if you lose the morale, you're going to lose the trust of all your employees. What employees do you have left? I really think it's a bad idea. And uh, I think the citizens of the city here should really look at it and scrutinize what's going on. And that's all i got to say. Thank you, Ed. Anyone else that would like to address council? Yes. Good evening, Marilyn. Good evening. I'm Marilyn Tyrrell at 950 G Street. Um, at, th at the last meeting, um, it went on and on and on. And at 8.30, uh, I had to, to leave. I was distressed to have to leave before it was over. Um, Councilman Greenlee talked about the workshops we had uh, but about the formation or the what am I trying to say the way you sat anyway that it it is only reasonable that people sitting around a table can talk to each other as opposed to the system that you currently have where you each one has to speak and hold up their hand and they speak in order and it just I don't think it works as well for you and it certainly I don't think is productive I know there was a hearing problem um, I w we use microphones at church and I asked them what they did about that because we have uh, hearing devices that are available um, I would like to see us return to the original situation and make the hearing devices available to those who can't hear um, I have no idea what they cost or where they come from, but uh, I would like I would like somebody to uh, to check into that, please, because I'm I'm having difficulty hearing, and that's more my problem than yours. But um, 
I think the workshops are important, and I think they should be changed. On the subject of water, which apparently is the subject of the evening, when I was not here on, I guess, the 6th, I was told that many of you, or most of you, or whatever, were not keen on this idea. And then I came in last week, and you were talking about spending $40,000 to give to these people to decide whether you wanted to work with them. And the idea that you, <coughs> a nonprofit, should give a profit making group $40,000 to figure out whether they want to do business with you um, seems pretty strange to me. Um, and I would really like you to reconsider it. Um, I have written a letter to, to the editor, and I'm going to ask Rose if she would distribute these to you. And the essence of my letter is that water is life, which is what Harvey has said. And our water is special. We have a bulletin that comes out once a year in which I take great pride in learning that our water is special. And you ought to too. And they do. They make special water for us. The idea that you're going to give this over into the hands of somebody who isn't us, who doesn't live with us, it's just, just appalling to me. Um, it's, it's not, I, I guess I'm saying it's not the money, but that's not true. It, it is part of the money, but I, I please wish that you would seriously think about this. This is something very precious. All that bottled, bottled water that comes, when you look at the bottles carefully, they're stealing water from little towns all over the place. We don't want Washougal water going out in bottles, and who's to stop it? Besides that, at the rate the town is growing, digging new wells and new wells and new wells, the aquifer has a volume, and you can't just add to water. You can't make water yet. Thank you, Marilyn. Is there anyone else that would like to address council? <coughs> Good evening, Greg. Greg Hebert, uh, Washougal, 111 11th Street. I just want to voice my opinion a little bit about the privatization. I don't know which direction you guys are headed. Um, heard lots of rumors where you're headed. Um, I hope it's not in favor of privatization. I've seen other places. It does not work. I moved here 26 years ago as a single parent with my daughter. This is a great town. And it has to do a lot with these guys right here that take care of it every day. Um, I work for a neighboring city. and. Uh, I take a lot of pride in that city and the city here. And I think what you're thinking about doing is absolutely insane. Um, it's happening all over the country. If you follow other cities that are doing this, go into privatization, it works for the first couple of years, a couple of years down the road, they're trying to get out of the contracts, it's not working, the quality of life is diminished. Um, I think you all that are sitting here have a pretty good idea. We don't want to do this. And if I look at most of your faces, I don't think either do you. And I really, really hope that you guys uh, think hard on this one. Um, it's these guys' livelihood. Um, they, it's, it's a special group of people. I work with these guys, <clears throat> maybe not side by side every day, but in contact with them. And I know how much they care. And uh, it bothers me. It really, really bothers me to think that you guys are even considering this. So that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Anyone else that would like to address council? <coughs> okay. Don't forget we do have, uh, there is another opportunity towards the end of the, the meeting as well. Uh, that takes us to our consent agenda. The consent agenda this evening has four items on it. Our council minutes of August 6, 2012, <coughs> workshop minutes of August 13, 2012, and our regular accounts payable claims in the amount of $278,134.48, and agenda bill 5112, setting a public hearing on medical marijuana collective gardens moratorium extension. Council? Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that we pass the consent agenda as read. Second. 
Hearing no objections, so ordered. Takes us into new business, uh, Agenda Bill 5212, holding a public hearing for floodplain regulation update and an adopt the update. Mitch. Thank you, Your Honor. Councilors. Uh, one sec here. All right, well, <laughs> my presentation is provided to you in the Dropbox, uh, so you can go through it. I'll hit the highlights of it. As you know, uh, FEMA has updated information regarding uh, floodplain, um, floodplain maps, firm maps, and a flood insurance study. And the National Flood Insurance Program relies on that, those maps in order to provide insurance to your constituents. Uh, consistent with federal law, when FEMA has an update to those regulations, uh, municipalities and communities have to adopt those and make reference to those new, um, that new information and, uh, or update their and update their regulations in order to comply with FEMA. There are some negative consequences if we fail to um, uh, update our regulations. They include uh, not being property owners not being able to purchase NFIP insurance. Federal grants or loans for develop development will not be available. Federal disaster assistance will not be provided. And federal mortgage insurance and loan guarantees will not be provided. FEMA updated, had two preliminary updates to their firm maps. Uh, one was in August 2006 and the second one was in August of 2010. And they took public testimony at those times and made revisions to those maps. And then in March of this year, they issued a final firm maps and a final FIS flood insurance study. Those, uh, that information is, becomes effective on September 5th of this year. There were several regulations, uh, our regulations, local regulations needed to be modified in order to comply with FEMA as well. We had changes to our critical areas definitions. We added a couple of definitions. We took out a couple of definitions and modified eight others. And then the regulations themselves, uh, there was language to clarify. There was correction language, and we reorganized it all, again, to be consistent with federal law. The notice of the application for our local uh, changes uh, was provided, was published on May 18th of this year. And consistent with state law, we issued a SEPA determination of non-significance on June 15th of this year. Planning Commission held a hearing on July 24, 2012, and their recommendation to you was that City Council approve the proposed amendments to the Washougal floodplain regulations as presented by staff at the July 24, 2012 public hearing. The recommended action for tonight is to hold a public hearing to take public testimony if council desires, make a motion to read the ordinance by title only and pass post and publish the ordinance in the usual manner. Thank you, Mitch. With that, I will open the public hearing and ask any members of the public who wish to speak uh, in regard to Agenda Bill 5212, Floodplain Regulations Update, to please step forward to the microphone. Okay. Second call for anyone wishing to comment on the agenda item. And this is a third and last call for any members of the public that wish to uh, comment on Agenda Bill 5212, Floodplain Regulations Update. Oh, there's your presentation. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, with that, I will close the public hearing and turn the item back to council. Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that we read the ordinance by title only. Hearing no objection, so ordered. An ordinance relating to the City of Washougal's continued participation in the National Flood Insurance Program by managing development and special flood hazard areas, parentheses 100-year floodplains, to reduce or eliminate damage from flooding through adoption of an updated flood insurance study, updated flood insurance rate maps, and amendments to development regulations amending Washougal Municipal Code 16.04.015 critical areas definitions 
in Washougal Municipal Code 16.04.060, critical areas, frequently flooded areas. Mr. Mayor, I move that we pass, post, and publish the ordinance in the usual manner. Second. We've got a second, a motion and a second to pass, post, and publish the ordinance in the usual manner. Any council discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> Uh, it takes us to Agenda Bill 53-12, uh, adoption of a resolution amending the City Council Rules of Procedure to add a new Section 2.7 for meeting cancellations. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you is a resolution that amends your Rules of Procedure, specifically to add a, a new Section 2.7, uh, which is implementing language for the recent authority that you granted the Mayor to cancel regularly scheduled uh, regular meetings and workshops. Uh, we reviewed uh, the proposed language in the new section 2.7 uh, a couple of times and, and the uh, revised rules are in your packet and the recommended action this evening is to read the resolution by title only and then to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that we read the resolution by title only. Hearing no objection, so ordered. A resolution amending the City Council Rules of Procedure. Mr. Mayor, I move that we pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Second. I've got a motion and a second to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Any council discussion? Dave? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, in paragraph 2-7, which is the amendment, the addition. Uh, first sentence says the mayor may cancel a regularly scheduled council meeting or workshop provided that the council meets at least once per month as provided by RCW. And my suggestion to my colleagues would be to add the specific uh, citation from RCW for uh, clarity so that people looking at this know immediately where to go to find uh, the information they're looking for. And I hope my colleagues will support me on that. Good. If, if you're moving an amendment, I'll second it. So moved. <laughs> do we have, uh, Don or Dave, do you have the RCW numbers there by chance? It's, uh, it's recited in, the, in our code where you granted the authority. So if it's appropriate, Don, they could refer to the code or otherwise I'd have to. I think if you'll just give us the authority to fill in the proper section, I don't have it. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Okay, so I've got a motion to amend item 2.7 meeting cancellation to include the appropriate RCW or reference to city code. Any council discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Any other council comment? Got a motion and a second to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, it takes us to Agenda Bill 5412, a professional services agreement with SAIC Energy Environment and Infrastructure LLC for owner's representative services for determining the feasibility of a design, build, operate, maintain public private partnership. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, before you is a request uh, for authorization, uh, the Mayor to sign a professional services agreement with uh, SAIC. Uh, as you know, we reviewed this at your workshop last week uh, and at a prior workshop as well. Uh, I have a very brief presentation this evening just to walk through uh, the revised scope of services. We worked with SAISC uh, in response to uh, your comments and input last week on what you uh, wanted to ensure was part of this uh, feasibility analysis and so we've worked with um, SAIC to make sure that we did that and I'll just briefly review that. Um, one item that was brought up I believe Council Member Shoemaker uh, brought this up was 
to ensure that there was clarity in the scope that uh, options would be evaluated, that it wasn't an all or nothing uh, conversation. And so we, um, this didn't increase the scope or change the scope in terms of its cost, but uh, they did, uh, working with us, provide some clarity. And you can find that in items one and five of task two. Uh, and so we are uh, confident that we'll have an options analysis for you. Uh, another that uh, was brought up by Councilman Greenlee uh, was the uh, uh, notion that the feasibility analysis maybe should be looking at the cost allocation implications as opposed to deferring that uh, in large part to a possible RFP process if that's where the council would go. So we did work with SAIC uh, to add additional scope and that's where uh, the additional cost is coming from, the new price of $45,000 as opposed to the 39. And there will be a, um, an analysis of the implications of, very, of the various options that are pursued uh, on the existing cost allocation plan that we have and any resultant impacts on uh, both the utility and the general funds. Uh, we will be working that. Uh, largely internally, it's our, it's our cost allocation plan. We can uh, run it for the different options, but we will have some support from SAIC, and that was what uh, increased the cost in the scope. Uh, another uh, comment was uh, regarding uh, staff deployment implications. This is a conversation that we've had a couple of times about uh, the fact that we deploy across unit lines in different circumstances that we encounter throughout the year. And uh, that adaptability and flexibility is really important for our operation. Uh, so we need to make sure that uh, we're looking at those impacts and whether there would be any impact on the utility and general funds and our operations for any of the options that might be. And again, the comment last week was to try to do as much of that preliminary work in this feasibility analysis as opposed to deferring that into the an RFP process if that's where the council would go with an RFP process. <coughs> so uh, we will be ensuring that that takes place as part of the feasibility analysis. And in this case, uh, no real additional scope uh, to the SAIC work. Uh, this will be internally uh, done. And uh, we have some data that we can work with and we'll be able to use that data against different options that might be presented. So we will ensure that uh, we take care of that in the feasibility stage. <laughs> and then just three other points. Um, some clarification within the scope that um, the feasibility analysis will not only look at potential savings uh, in the short and long term as part of a public-private partnership, but it will also look at potential savings and efficiencies that we might realize on our own. And so at the conclusion of the feasibility analysis and upon presentation of any recommendations that SAIC uh, and the administration have with respect to moving forward, uh, whether we recommend against it or if the council chooses not to go that direction, there will be some fruit from this effort around uh, potential savings and efficiencies that we would uh, realize on our own. Uh, kind of mentioned this already, but uh, there'll be a, both a short and a long look as part of the feasibility <coughs> analysis around potential savings and efficiencies. Uh, and then a couple of things that we talked about last week a little bit, um, the risk allocation assessment and a detailed legal review. Uh, after we've uh, had some more conversation, really we can be deferring uh, in bulk those conversations, they become uh, much more important uh, when you start looking at responses to RFPs and you really package what you will ask and when you're preparing the RFP, in fact, uh, as you look at what you'll be asking potential respondents uh, to consider. Uh, so uh, a little bit of that backed out of the scope, a little bit more work on their behalf uh, resulted in uh, about a 10% or so cost increase over the current or the quote that had been provided before. Uh, so again, the recommended <coughs> action this evening is to authorize the mayor to enter into the professional services agreement with SAIC for the feasibility analysis. Um, the amount is uh, on the order of $45,000. Um, it is uh, within the uh, appropriation in the utility funds for professional services and uh, is a budgeted expenditure, if you would. 
and that is the recommended action for this evening. Thank you, Dave. Council? Dave? Question? Dave, uh, can you tell us, can you clarify something for us? Uh, one of the uh, public speakers this evening uh, raised the issue of us uh, spending money for a study to determine whether the unit, uh, the organization that would do the study uh, would eventually wind up doing business with us. That's my, not my understanding of the contract. My understanding of the contract is that uh, SAIC will do a study determining whether or not it's feasible for us to go to uh, contract operations. Correct. The uh, proposed scope is a feasibility analysis of a possible procurement approach for upgrades to our sewer facility. Yes. Specifically a design build approach. But additionally, it includes potentially the operations and management and maintenance of um, not only the plant and the upgraded plant, but all of the utilities. Uh, so SAIC would not be a service provider for any of that work. Uh, they provide this type of service in terms of uh, helping owners, uh, municipal uh, agencies, and special purpose districts uh, work through design build processes and design build operate and maintain processes as well. I appreciate the clarification. I thought maybe our speaker had picked up something that I hadn't picked up. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Other comments from other council members? Brent? Dave, um, before we go here, uh, one of the things that I'm always concerned about are, are we making a good business decision? We're about to spend close to $50,000 on uh, a study to find out whether we need to proceed with this process. And I'd just kind of like to hear from you what makes you think, at least at a first look, even before we spend $50,000 or $45,000, uh, that this will result in uh, saving money in a, in a long-term process. And, and I, because I want to know that, that you think and when, why you think this would be a good business decision to proceed with. Well, uh, I think that the broader question in that regard that we first began to discuss was uh, the direction we were heading, which was to begin the development of an RFP and to prepare an RFP and to go out for a full uh, procurement process for design, build, operate, and uh, maintain. And the reason behind bringing that forward from the administration was that in our initial conversations mm -hmm. uh, with potential service providers, uh, there was uh, the potential for savings not only in getting the plant online but also in ongoing operations and maintenance and although those numbers were very general and we had nothing specific and we acknowledged that we were talking to their business development teams uh, there was enough information there for to lead us to believe that uh, that procurement uh, method would be a viable alternative for the community and that we should consider it so that we can determine what those savings would be and we felt confident that there would be some but that's just one part of the equation as you know uh, council in uh, reaching a decision on whether to enter into a public-private partnership for any services that we provide financial is one aspect but it's an important aspect certainly in everything that we do and certainly in, in our rate conversations and and, and all of the other financial <coughs> conversations we've been having about our utilities uh, so investing in that level of engagement with owners agents was something that we felt was a good business decision uh, for possible savings not guaranteed um, but based upon the concerns that we heard uh, from the council about and, and some concerns that we had on our own about the scope of that undertaking and the time that was involved to really get all of the answers uh, and the possibility for off-ramps in the process perhaps being uh, a preferable approach, this alternative uh, approach is being recommended where there's a feasibility analysis at much less cost initially. And so uh, refined by this alternative process, I think makes it e an even better business decision in terms of uh, taking an initial look at much less investment and uh, what provide some further uh, support for that notion is that uh, the look that they'll be taking for us will bear fruit for us, we believe, mm -hmm. 
whether or not uh, the council decides to pursue the development of an RFP and to solicit responses to that for the O&M side of it, uh, I think we will find that uh, a design build approach at, at a minimum might make sense. So I think there'll be fruit no matter what happens, even if it's just the DB. And I think therefore, uh, well, you, I, you know, I, I'm a big believer in my own personal experience in the design build process. Uh, I'm much less sold on the idea of, uh, and I don't even like the term public private partnership that has kind of some odd connotations. I don't think it exactly describes what we're doing here. Uh, I'm much less sold on that, but I think design build is something that we're you know, almost certain to find will save money in, in uh, uh, building this plant. But wh what I'd like to ask you is, um, if we had decided to take the, the uh, so-called public-private partnership off the table, would we still be pursuing, pursuing some kind of uh, uh, contract to uh, study the viability of that in this situation? Probably a reduced scope contract. Of the DB? Yeah. Yes, I, I think you're asking what's the implication of the council choosing not to do the full scope of this feasibility analysis. DB, yeah. uh, I think what we would probably do is we have, uh, we would see that as direction that the council was not interested in pursuing uh, a public-private partnership for um, O&M. And uh, so we would move that off the table and then we would um, begin to deliver the plant upgrades that we've already received council direction to pursue and that happened in uh, the rates work that we've done and also in the bond that's already been issued uh, we would just that would just be administrative uh, the scope of agreement with the owner's agent would be truncated it would be within the uh, mayor's authority and we would just move forward uh, to take care of the plant upgrades I'm not I'm not prepared to go there yet but I just wonder if that was an option that's that's what we would do we certainly we would uh, probably be working with SAIC and it would just be to deliver the plant uh, upgrades for the community and, and kicking the tires on a DB approach. There's no guarantee the DB approach would be the preferable approach, but I think we would want to do some feasibility. We'd want to do some feasibility conversation with that as well, I believe. And and I, actually, I should clarify. I think I think it would be prudent to uh, uh, take them up on their scope with respect to opportunities for efficiencies and savings that w we could achieve on our own. Uh, but because it wouldn't be in the context per se of an RFP and a, and a DBOM. Perhaps the scope, uh, the cost, and the, the the effort entailed would go down, and it would be a, a smaller scope. Well, for the public here, I I have the feeling that we're talking in shorthand, and and that doesn't really make a lot of sense to people. Um, what, roughly three years ago, we did a fairly expensive capital planning study for water and wastewater utilities in particular. We looked at rate structures and in particular we looked at capital facilities plans. <coughs> we have been frankly fending off the Department of Ecology for years. Once you get to be a certain size, they want us to have, in technical terms, a second oxidation ditch at wastewater. That's that thing that the sprinkler moves around. That's where wastewater is treated and the, the is made relatively benign. The short of it is that it looked like we needed to spend on the order of, correct me if I'm wrong on the number, <coughs> about $10 million on wastewater improvements. More than that? What was the number? I think the initial estimates were closer to 15 for that part. And there are some other system improvements right. in the plan as well. And, and at the same time, we also needed to add some drinking water improvements, in particular the reservoir up on Mount Norway that we call number four, which is a big water tank that was necessary to provide adequate water pressure, especially for firefighting, in the northeast corner of the city. We council passed a bond issue 
and the, well, actually, the capital plans first, and then authorization for a bond issue to support all of those. And as part of that, also an ongoing rate increase in both drinking water and wastewater. We had a choice of basically doubling the rate in one year or raising it 14% every year for five years. We chose the latter. But we're in the middle of 14% annual increases in both water and wastewater rates. And there are a number of people who are very unhappy about that. They uh, have made their, their that very well known here in, in public comments. So I think there is there's a valid concern that we're saying you know there's there's these are huge numbers, fifteen million dollars a year. That's a big number. I mean, fifteen million dollars for a wastewater plant. That's a big number, and you really want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. We had one consultant who helped us develop all of these plans, and I frankly think it's a good idea to have another firm of the size and competence of SAIC look over their shoulder and tell us whether they got it right. The, the, to go from design, build, to design, build, operate, and maintain, I'm not at all sold on that. The, the history on that that I read is not good. On the other hand, I think we have an obligation, given this being in the middle of these rate increases that are so onerous, that we really figure out what, if anything, we can do to stave off some of those increases. So to have to spend $45,000 to decide whether or not it makes sense to spend somewhere between $250,000 and $500,000 to develop a request for proposals which is called an RFP. That's an important part of the bidding process. And as you may or may not know, the bidding process is governed very closely by law and regulation as to how you develop it and that you have to take the, highest the lowest qualified bidder. And if you screw it up and you leave out something important from your RFP and they bid on that, and then you have to add it in later, it will cost you through the nose and other places too. So it's very important to get that RFP right. And to just wade out and say we're going to spend a quarter of a million dollars or a half a million dollars to develop an RFP without knowing some more information, I agree, that doesn't make sense. It really makes sense to, to touch some bases first. So what the, what the scope here is, is review the existing operations, maintenance practices, and staffing levels. And our previous utilities study did that. So this is kind of looking over their shoulder using their information to see whether they got it right. Similarly, rates, budgets, including operations and maintenance, administrative costs, capital expenditures, including debt service. I mean, we've got, what, a 20-some million dollar bond out there? 16 currently. Right. I mean, we issued a portion of ultimately what needs to be issued, although we are working, as you mentioned, Councilman, to uh, mitigate some of the necessary improvements to, to lower those amounts. But yes, we have issued extensive debt already. So 
review the wastewater facilities plan, the sewer plan and the comprehensive water plan to identify the growth and pro proposed future capital improvements. <coughs> this plan was done mostly four years ago, three and four years ago. Is that right, Trevor or Jim? The it is, it's not completed at this time. Right, but the, the capital plan that they did, that's right. three so years old, right? So you think back to 2009, and yes, we'd had the Great Recession, but I don't think, I think a lot of people thought we would be back in boom times by now, and we're not. So that, that planning for, that, for those capital, for those required capital improvements, is that still current, or does that need to be modified? That's something that needs to be looked at. Evaluate the wastewater treatment plant imp improvements proposed in the facilities plan to determine the need and the likely timing. When are we going to need them? The problem, of course, is that there's a huge lag time between deciding that you need them and actually having them. The permitting process takes years. Um, to wrap things up a little bit, other things that, that are now in this scope, um, I mean, Dave talked about, uh, Administrator Scott talked about adaptability and flexibility. That's, that's the issue that I brought up when I said, you know, we use, if, if we have a snow emergency, we use our water and wastewater guys to plow streets. That's the flexibility and adaptability that we're talking about. And if, if uh, I personally am concerned that if we had a private operator, then we don't have access to those people to do that plowing, and we have to go out and have a, have a standby contract with somebody to do that for us. Whether they do it or not, we're going to have to pay them some just to be there. And then the other thing that he talked about was the, the impacts of intergovernmental funding the, the, both all of the utilities pay the finance department to produce the billing and also to handle the payables. They pay the administrative department for management services as they pay the public works head office for, for administrative services. And to some degree they pay the engineer, the city engineer's salary depending on what each of those people do for each of the for each of the utilities there has to be an accounting for that it's fairly careful accounting and for those uh, who were here last week when i mentioned the city of camas got a finding from the auditor it was because the auditor thought that they hadn't been careful enough in documenting those intergovernmental transfers from the utilities to pay for the administrative services in City Hall. So we're under the gun here also from the auditor's office. We now have to have spend more finance time keeping track of, of those kinds of things, whereas we used to frankly just kind of say, eh, it's about that much. Now we actually have to keep track of it. And that costs money. So <coughs> privatizing things would have impact on departments above and beyond drinking water or wastewater or stormwater or anything else. And then the other thing to say is that because of that kind of arm's length relationship that you have to have between, actually it's even further than arm's length, between the city and your potential bidders. Nobody wants to create any kind of collusion here about saying, going to some potential bidder and saying, well, what do you think should be in the contract? That's not how it's done. And so one of the things that, that SAIF would do is conduct informal discussions with several service providers to gauge their interest in a service agreement of this type, scope, and cost of a Wishugo contract and get input. 
which they can then bring back to the city and by putting that third party in between there you solve some of that conflict of interest problem. So this is, in my mind, this is a fairly small contract. There are a lot of things in it that I think are worth doing. I remain very skeptical about PPP. Um, and on the other hand, I think we have an obligation given these 14% a year rate increases for five years. We have an obligation to look and see if there's any way that we can save money and cut those increases. So I hope that makes it a little easier to understand some of what's going on here. It, this, this privatization thing has taken over the entire discussion and there's a lot more here than that and I personally could be perfectly happy with this if it didn't have any of the private privatization discussion in it. So that's my own feeling and, and I hope that helps people to understand a little bit of what's going on. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Oh, I just want to thank Councilman Greenlee for a great wrap up of a many pronged effort to define all of these things we're approaching. I'm just looking back at my childhood. A number of you in this room can relate that we used to shop at five and tens. Can't do that anymore, can we? Can't buy three pieces of licorice for a penny anymore. And to get my mind around a contract, approximately $40,000 just to see whether we should or shouldn't, that's tough. And that's pretty much what you were uh, dealing with in your in your conversation. So it is hard, but what it is is checks and balances. You're you're asking us to be very cautious, and that's what this process is for people to be able to look at all angles of this process. So checks and balances is what it makes us comfortable in making decisions. And um, I don't know if uh, Administrator Scott convey to you my appreciation before the price tag on this raised above the level, but um, you had the right to just sign this off and you brought it to us. So I want to personally say thanks for doing that so we can have this conversation as a council and as a city. It's, it's, vi it's very important that we, we get it out on the table <coughs> because we're citizens too and we have water bills too. And we're not doing anything behind anyone's back, that is for sure. We want to, I love David's comments, he likes to kick the tires. He, he's a road guy. He has a lot of road analogies with off ramps and <laughs> kicking tires and checking under the hood for things. And so that's what we're here to do. Let's, let's just get it on the table and let's have a long discussion. Let's talk about it as long as we need. Because these are, these are um, steps that the city is obligated to take as far as improvements in our, in our system. The question is, what's the wisest process and who's the best builder. That's what this, uh, this company is looking to tell us. So let's go, I, I just wanna say thank you for clarifying the shorthand. Oh, I can remember, in fact, still to this day, I have to say, what does that mean? Because you're using all these initials, uh, D-B-O-M. Oh, that means for design, build, operate, and maintain. I get it. <laughs> so it's good to take time because this is new to so many people. So just uh, another few more comments on Paul Greenlee's recap, so thank you. Thank you, Connie Joe. Dave? Second time around and last time, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I'd like to uh, add to what uh, Connie Joe said. Uh, kudos to you and your staff for taking this issue on. It's a rough issue. Uh, there are political costs involved in it. Uh, not that we should consider those, but I think it was courageous of you to take on the issue. Secondly, I'd like to uh, briefly, I hope, summarize uh, a major point that I think Mr. Greenlee made uh, so that it doesn't get lost in, in that dissertation that he just provided us, and that is that uh, good decision-making requires knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge acquisition has a price tag. In this case, it's $45,000. 
My personal philosophy on decision making is, uh, and I got this from the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, which has a plaque on the wall and it says, in God we trust. Everybody else has to show us the data. <laughs> we want to see the data. This will get us the data so that we can make a good decision. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dave. Any other council comments? Karen? Again, my chicken scratch. Um, what are the rate, I should probably know this, but what are the uh, rate increases over the next three years? Because we're in year two, correct? Because I didn't think it was 14 for the next three years, like evenly. It, it varies with utility service. Uh, we have three utilities, and I'm not going to recall precisely what they all are. I don't know if Jim has that information right in front of him. Uh, some are higher than okay. that. So maybe 14 is the average? Uh, yeah. One of them is right around that, and uh, it's less than 10%, if I recall, for, for storm. Uh, okay. But they are, in, in total, I think, which is perhaps a more meaningful uh, expression of the increase, over the five years, in aggregate, it was about a 127% increase in what you would see in a, in a typical residential bill. Okay. for example, but that will depend on usage. Uh, significant increases over five years. Um, I may be a little off on that 127. I know we provided that for Dawn recently. And here's Mitch with... Um, Pulling it up. The website, our homepage. Added. This has the, uh, the actual numbers and uh, not percentages. I used to be really good at math, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, your water bi-monthly single-family water bill for the first unit in 11 is $47.08, and in 2015 it'll be $77.10. So that one's not quite doubled, so not quite a 100% increase. Um, but that's the multifamily. Anyway. It's, it's significant, okay. I think. Yeah, and which I knew that. Point. I just, right. yeah, okay. I, I just have to say this is, this is a tough one. I've, um, I actually left uh, the budgeting conference on Friday, hopped to my car in Leavenworth, and I'm not sure if it was AM or FM radio, um, but they were discussing water utilities in Washington, D.C. I'm like, well, this is perfect. I have five hours to learn all about Washington, D.C. and what in the world they're doing. Um, but weaving in and out of service, um, you know, one of the main things that they were saying is that, you know, water is a, a commodity that I think a lot of us take for granted. Um, and here in Washougal, we obviously have um, some pretty great water and we have some great guys that work for us. Um, I just feel like Maybe as a city, we haven't done a great job of um, explaining to citizens how much it does cost to have this service. Um, not to say that our water bills are not extremely high and are going up, you know, over the next three years. Um, it's just hard. It's hard for me to want to vote yes um, for $45,000 when all I hear from the citizens is no, that they would rather keep it local um, in their city with, you know, men and women who live and work in Washougal. You know, they want it, the people that I've talked to. So um, I just wonder if there's another avenue out there to help people with their bills, to save for the upgrade to the treatment plant, and to educate people on how their bill why their bill is what it is and how it compares maybe to other cities locally. Um, my other big issue is, um, I don't know what the term for it would be, would cross. I, I just know that the guys really help out in streets. When there's snow on my street, it seems to be, I would not get out if there was not guys helping on my street in particular. So. Um, yeah, so those are just some of the thoughts that I had. So, anyways, thank you. 
Well, I'm under the impression that this proposal will not be addressing our rates. It's the design, build, and operate, maintain facility, and not our actual water rates. Am I mistaken? No, uh, this is not a rate analysis. Right. Uh, however, um, the rates are primary source of revenue, uh, one of the primary sources of revenue, and so SAIC needs to have an understanding of that context in order to do an informed feasibility study for us. So that's why the scope discusses that they're going to be reviewing the rates as, as well as our budgets. It's so that they can work with us on that. Um, how b the broad context of why the administration is advancing this uh, proposal, though I believe is somewhat directly related to the rate increases and trying to mitigate for the community as much as we possibly can the cost of providing these important services to the community. And you may recall when we uh, workshopped uh, maybe two times ago on this, we talked about a, a multi-pronged approach to trying to mitigate the costs. One of those is um, value engineering, if, if that's the right term, our capital facilities plan. Do we really need the redundancy that's in it? What's the timing of that? Are there other ways that we can truncate the plan and reduce the amount of debt that we need to undertake uh, and therefore reduce the rate increases in the short to medium term. Uh, operationally, are there savings and efficiencies that we could uh, find uh, so that that could contribute to mitigating uh, the costs? And this is that part of the equation. Can we have that part of the equation by removing the private public part of it? <coughs> we we will always strive to find savings and efficiencies under whatever context the council wishes us to do so. So if it's your pleasure that um, uh, O&M not be uh, explored in terms of a 3P, we won't explore what potential uh, savings and efficiencies there would be from that, but we will still explore uh, savings and efficiencies with our current operations and maintenance. And in fact, um, that's part of what's in this uh, scope is to do just that. So if the, if the uh, pleasure of the council is to not scope uh, SAIC with uh, exploring the O&M side of it, we will still explore uh, efficiencies and savings in that regard, but there'd be one opportunity that we wouldn't pursue, not just be the, the 3P opportunity on the O&M piece. I do have, if, if it's the council's pleasure, just, just to kind of get a number on it, um, the actual percentages. Um, next year, stormwater is 14 and a half, and it's the same in 14 and 15. Uh, sewer is 26 and a half, so there's the uh, 11 and 11 in uh, 14 and 15, respectively, and water is 13, 13, and 13. So those are significant increases, as you know. You've taken that action already, and that is what will be happening. Um, I can tell you that preliminary findings from some of our own value engineering efforts, some of SAICs, because they did some already in preparation for um, meeting with us when we interviewed uh, possible owner's agents, we believe that there's going to be opportunity in our capital plan and we believe that it will provide real mitigation. We just haven't fully explored that so that we have something to present. So one of the prongs of our approach, we believe is going to bring some relief and that's very encouraging uh, to know so far. Um, this was a very tough decision. Um, I was actually on the council as we were going through the water, sewer, and stormwater rate studies over the years. And we, when we implemented the five-year plan, it was a very tough decision, probably the toughest vote I've ever had to cast. It was a unanimous decision. All seven council members voted um, to implement this uh, five-year rate plan, uh, knowing that it was the right thing to do. Um, there were 
many, many reasons, and I won't go into them tonight. Um, it's all available on the website. We have a very long list of projects that we need to get started on. Um, I know that everyone is feeling pain at the pump, so to speak. I am as well, and I'm very sensitive to that. Um, and I'm very much in favor of continuing to look at other ways to lower costs for our ratepayers, but I do not agree that outsourcing the operations and maintenance is the appropriate way to accomplish this. $45,000 to start and several hundred thousand dollars after is a lot of money out of the utility. I'd rather see 100% of the funds we collect be put towards the projects that we've planned for already. Therefore, I won't be supporting this proposal. It occurs to me, if I remember correctly from the capital study, the facilities planning, that at least a portion of what we're concerned about is, uh, for instance, there's some people in the room who remember when, to put it euphemistically, in the oxidation ditch, the bugs died. And we had a problem that we weren't treating our sewage very well. And one of the reasons you'd like to have a second oxidation ditch is that they're independent and if one of them goes gunny sacks, you can use the other. I'm back to peak load leveling here. It strikes me that we might investigate with CAMAS whether they might be able, whether we might enter into standby agreements so that if they had a problem, we could pick up some of their problem and if we had a problem, they could pick up some of ours on a peak load leveling kind of basis. It strikes me that building even a large sewer line that connected the two plants would be probably nowhere close to the kind of money we're talking about for the bigger plant. Um, I'm not sure. Um, certainly look at that. But it, 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 I think it's a question that it would be an interesting one to ask. I, d I don't know how, f maybe you can answer it and maybe Rob Charles can answer it or, or Trevor can answer it in, in 15 seconds. But if it's more involved than that, um, I, think, I think it's worth looking into and maybe SAIC, SAIC could do that also. Angel? One of the major concerns mentioned here tonight and through conversations we've had is that other cities have privatized, may not have been water, it could be other issues, and that it doesn't work after that initial contract. Will SAIC show us any type of reports and comparisons of other cities that have walked this walk and, and tell us what the next contract came out as? We always know that in the beginning, it's the honeymoon and people are gonna try to save some money to get the bid, to get the job. So I'm asking if SAIC will show those numbers of other cities. Uh, we can make sure of that. Be, that day, I think that helpful. date is available to us. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, um, uh, there's a spectrum of uh, success and failure, uh, decisions to come in and out of these types of relationships decisions to expand the scope of services, to shrink the scope of services, and I think each community's experience is unique. I don't think that you can make a blanket statement uh, for or against it. I, I think it really is a community-based choice. There are examples of communities that have been doing it for a long time, and they have their reasons for doing that. There are examples of communities that started to do it, and now they don't do it. And there are examples of, uh, in between of that, but we can make sure uh, to uh, be able to share the experience of others, particularly those that might be as similar to us as, as we can find. And mm -hmm. we've done a little bit of that, uh, but we have not exhausted that uh, by any means. It's good to know that we can enter into a contract. If we change our mind, we can back out of that contract. Um, and can you remind me uh, what cities our neighbor, what neighbor cities are already doing this approach? 
uh, Vancouver, uh, mo most closely, Vancouver uh, is in a relationship with a, a private vendor uh, at their sewer treatment facilities, and uh, I believe maybe a couple of their pump stations, but that's the extent of it, so they do not uh, uh, have a service provider uh, for what's called outside of the fence, outside of the plant. So water is completely in-house there. Uh, Gresham uh, does this, uh, Wilsonville, uh, Tualatin Valley Water, uh, Stevenson uh, has a, a, a smaller facility. Uh, it's been a mixed bag for them, for example. Um, and I'm forgetting some of the others. If you look back, uh, Councilwoman, uh, in the Dropbox, um, I think there are some uh, charts that we provided that show some of the uh, others that are doing some things. Okay. And we will certainly, um, if it's the Council's pleasure uh, to undertake this feasibility analysis, we'll make sure that um, we have information about others' experiences. Good, thank you. If I can kind of summarize what this proposal is this contract that we're going to be executing with uh, if we approve this executing with this company there's actually I see three it can be broken down into three parts the feasibility of a design build rather than going through traditional public contracting to build the sewer plant that's part one correct part two is uh, internal changes that we can do which do not necessarily involve contracting for services just internal management changes and that's going to be part of their scope of services correct and part three is broadly called O&M, which can be uh, using private parties, and it may not be using private parties. There might be other efficiencies in O&M that could be discovered in this process, I would assume, as well. Or would that be folded into the internal charges? Uh, change probably would be in that uh, okay. second category. Um, I, I would also like to look at consolidation, if we could. I, don't, I know we, that isn't, I didn't see that in the scope of services, but consolidation with cameras and some arrangements we could make with that. But you know, let's not, let's not go there tonight. Uh, if we haven't done that already. Um, as far as the design build process goes, one of the things I've learned being in, in this area for many years um, is it costs the public a lot more to do a project than it can be done in the private sector. And that's because of some of the constraints we have in our public bidding laws. Um, we have to, the, the, the bid has to match the RFP, and if it doesn't, then we're off on a, on a tangent here, and it just, it just basically adds, and the, the, the Contractors add to their cost because they know they're stuck with that price, and that they they underbid too much, they're going to be uh, you know, losing money on the contract. Whereas design build gets around a lot of this stuff because you don't need to strictly comply with these public bidding laws, which raises the price of, of the public sector to do a project. To me, I'd be very surprised if when we did this design build project, if we after we did this contract, the design build would not save us money. I mean, I, I can you know tell you from personal experience that. It, most likely will save us money. And as far as the contracting for uh, services at component of this, I don't really see that as uh, you know the whole contract here. It's a sort of significant because of some of the symbolic things about it, but I don't know that that's really central to this as much as it's been made up to be. Um, you know, I, I, the question is, do I want to know the information of whether it'll work? Yeah, I'd like to know that. And if we excise it from this contract, which is a possibility, um, you know, we're not going to know that. Um, but I will say that they would have to, you know, they have a heavy burden to convince me that it's going to work. Because I've heard, I've heard the same things about other jurisdictions. It's not working out. So um, I'm willing to support this, but um, the case will have to be pretty compelling before I would proceed with an RFP on, on uh, privatizing our O&M. Other council comments? Is there a motion on the recommended action? Move for approval. Second. Okay, I've got a motion and a second. It would seem odd, but at this point I'm going to ask if there's any further council comments. Hearing none, I'm going to add a few of my own. Um, First, I want to start out by thanking the staff, thanking Dave, Jim, and Trevor for <clears throat> putting this entire uh, issue into a context that 
makes sense for us to bring forward. I also want to thank the staff that we have, certainly the ones who are here this evening who are very entwined in this issue and how it affects the city and how it affects yourselves. Um, there's been, it's easy in, in the discussions um, for us to insert the words administration, insert the word staff, that type of thing. I want to make sure and remind everybody, especially those of you who have not been in these discussions before, that the impetus for the issue that we're undertaking today and the contract that we're looking at came from me and from only me. Mr. Scott, Mr. Dunn, and Mr. Evers are simply carrying out what the directives are for moving forward on this issue. It would be unbelievably simple for any individual sitting in the mayor's seat, whether in good times or in bad times, to say that there are certain areas of expenses we are absolutely not going to turn over and look at. That would be the easiest thing in the world to do. And that's not my job. That's not how I view my job. State law says that the mayor and the administration are to bring forward to the council alternatives and initiatives. And that's simply what this is. There is no one in this room that wants to see us privatize our water, our sewer, our stormwater. I don't believe there's anybody that in the room that would like to see us do that. I believe though, as has been expressed by a number of the council members up here, that there are thousands of ratepayers in the city that I believe we owe an obligation to, to make sure <coughs> that we are providing our services in the absolutely most efficient manner possible, whatever those things may be. It impacts all of us. It impacts the city. You know, we pay our own water bills. Amazingly enough, we have to pay them out of our different accounts for different places, whether it's fire hydrants, whether it's the parks, whether it's here at City Hall. We get hit by the, the same increases that we're paying with your tax dollars. I don't know, quite frankly, I'm not sure where this issue will go in the end. Nor is that really my concern. My concern is bringing it forward to the council for their deliberations in order to see if this is something we want to go down the road of to find out what, if what we're doing as providers is the most efficient that we can. The council certainly, in some of you have alluded to it this evening. You certainly have the ability to stop this thing dead. And that is certainly in your prerogatives. Our prerogative from the administration standpoint is again to bring the issue forward, bring the alternatives forward, and bring the initiatives forward for you to consider in doing that. Frankly, I would have a tough time explaining to anybody, well, I couldn't explain to anybody, that were to ask me in the future, have you looked at every alternative? My water bills are so high, my sewer bills are so high. Have you looked at everything possible to make sure that they are the lowest that they can be? We would not have that information in order to say, yes, we have looked at every alternative. That in itself is the piece that you're left out there with. It is certainly the council's prerogative though. If, uh, if I had a crystal ball and I wanted to see how this thing would play out, I've told some of you before, <clears throat> we would likely spend the dollars that we have in front of us to find out that our process and our individuals that we have are the most efficient way to provide this service. And to me, in a department that costs us millions of dollars a year, to me that would be money well spent for us to be able to close that door and say, yes, we've looked at it. No, no one can do it better than what we're already doing it. And I have confidence that that is likely what we may find. Again, it would be very easy just to turn ahead and say we are not going to look at that th amount of expenses. But it is not something that I feel that I can do given my position. With that, are there any other council comments? Paul? I, I just wanted to say I, I pretty much agree with, with what you said, and I, I want to be clear 
to everyone that if what comes back is something that looks like a whitewash job on, yes, DBOM, it will die an ugly death. The, what I'm looking for here is a lot more than a simple answer to DBOM, yay or nay. I really want to have at least a superficial review of the capital facilities plan, its timing, what we real, do we really have to do all of these pieces? Are these cost estimates reasonable? And this isn't really part of this discussion, but I really would like to pursue the rate study further along also. Okay, any further council comment? Okay, I've got a motion and a second to authorize the mayor to sign the professional services agreement submitted by SAIC Energy Environment and Infrastructure LLC. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Nay. Motion carries. Roll call. Councilmember Boger? Uh, aye. Councilmember Plinsky? Nay. Councilmember Greenlee? Aye. Councilmember Lindsay? Nay. Councilmember McDaniel? No. Councilmember Shoemaker? Aye. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Motion carries 5-2. Four, Four to three. three. Did we have another no in there? Oh, sorry. Plinsky, Lindsay. Correction, four to three. With that, we're going to take about uh, an 11 minute break. Uh, we do have the continuation of this meeting. Uh, we'll be in the community center next door uh, dealing with a joint workshop between the city council and our strategic planning advisory committee on updates to the uh, strategic planning process. So if we could, we will take just a few minutes break and meet over there at 25 minutes. Two eight. We're not gonna reconvene in here. No, we're going to reconvene over there. Okay.